So welcome everyone as we come back together for the second of the Sinai and Synapses seminars as we are talking about belief and knowledge, doubt and uncertainty, and start by introducing Dr. Carl Guyberson, who I was able to find. He had written a piece in the Huffington Post a couple of years ago that I read and I loved and I sent him an email and we started talking and we had a wonderful conversation a couple of years ago for about an hour, hour and a half, and Carl is on the advisory board of, of Sinai and Synapses, so I'm so thrilled that you're here with us this morning. So this is, uh, this is actually a slightly abbreviated version of Carl's bio, because there's a lot that he's done. Dr. Carl Guyberson holds a PhD in physics from Rice University, and has lectured on science and religion at the Vatican, Oxford University, <coughs> and many prestigious universities, including MIT, Brigham Young, and Xavier University. He's published more than 200 reviews and essays, both technical and popular, and outlets that include the New York Times, Huffington Post, The Daily Beast, USA Today, Salon.com, and TheEdge.org. He's written and or co-authored nine books and contributed to many edited volumes, and two of his books here that I have read that I highly recommend. One is called The Language of Science and Faith, which he co-wrote with uh, Francis Collins, and Saving Darwin, How to Be a Christian and Believe in Evolution. Very, very thought-provoking books. Uh, Carl's also a regular contributor to the public dialogue on science and faith. He's appeared as a, guest, as a guest on NPR's Morning Edition and Talk of the Nation. He was a founding editor of Science and Theology News, editor-in-chief of Science and Spirit Magazine, <coughs> and was the vice president of the BioLogos Foundation. He currently teaches writing and science and religion in the Cornerstone Program at Stonehill College. He lectures at universities, churches, and other venues across the country. He's also working on his 10th book, which is due for publication in 2014. So please join with me in welcoming Dr. Carl Guyberson. Go ahead. Um, OK, uh, I, I want to start by making a, uh, and I think this will just be something I want to put on the table for our discussion uh, today so we can kind of uh, interrogate it a bit uh, later. But I want to make a kind of a, an apologetic for the scientific uh, way of knowing, uh, lest we get too caught up in uh, celebrating the virtues of uh, ignorance. Uh, <laughs> uh, goes on. Uh, so here's here's the simple story uh, that that you get kind of from uh, the survey of our uh, Western conversation about knowing things. That we we look back to the ancient Greeks and uh, Thales of Miletus, 500 B.C. and so on as a as an initial thinker. Uh, and, and we find uh, Plato and Aristotle making uh, sweeping statements about the nature of reality with, with enormous confidence, and speaking, uh, in Plato's case, of a world of forms that he was certain was more real than this, this world here, and, and, and stating that with great uh, certainty. A Aristotle speaking of the perfection of the heavens and even the composition uh, of the heavens uh, as if these were uh, simple certainties. Uh, the developing Christian tradition uh, spoke with great confidence uh, in its uh, new truths, uh, the, the divinity of Jesus, the reality of original sin, the biblical miracles, and so on, it, 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 as if finding out great truths was somehow uh, very, very uh, simple. Uh, by the 17th century, these confident assertions were being examined with some skepticism. Uh, it had become clear that both the Catholic theological tradition, uh, think Luther, um, and the Aristotelian scientific tradition, uh, think Galileo, uh, were both under assault. Uh, so the confidence that one could make sweeping statements about ultimate reality uh, began to erode, and philosophy began to think harder about, well, how, how is it that we know things? Uh, Descartes and Spinoza, was, you know, we know, pursued a rationalist track. Uh, Francis Bacon pursued an empirical track, and then Immanuel Kant provided a sort of a wise Solomon resolution by combining these in a uh, particular way. Uh, but Kant's resolution of this tension uh, got nibbled away by skeptical termites, with the result that by the, the 20th century, philosophers had essentially given up on finding out how we might actually come to know anything. They contented themselves with trying to figure out what statements meant, rather mm -hmm. than if they contained any truth about the world, mm -hmm. uh, where Plato uh, Augustine and Spinoza were untroubled by specific claims about the exact nature of God. 20th century philosophers were content to ask, what do we mean when we say, I believe in God, without regard to whether the noun God actually refers to anything at all? Uh, 
The scientific community missed out on this discouraging philosophical conversation with its uh, shriveling ambitions. Uh, starting with Galileo, Kepler, and Newton, new sciences were steadily born. Astronomy, physics, geology, chemistry, biology, cosmology, each, each new science uh, provided profound new insights into the world. Some of those insights, like energy is always conserved in every interaction, or the universe originated in a Big Bang 14 billion years ago, have the same sort of sweeping scope as the pronouncements of uh, Plato and Augustine, uh, and thus should be tossed, I suppose, on the ash heap with Plato's forms and Augustine's original sin, and yet they are not. Uh, millions of people uh, are tuning in uh, even now to the new Cosmos series with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they will accept much of what he says about the world, even mm -hmm. such grand statements. Uh, so how has science escaped the philosophical inquisition? How has it climbed up the slippery slope of certainty unnoticed by philosophy sliding down? that slope. Uh, this is one of the central mysteries of, of postmodernity, although no scientists are even aware of it since uh, postmodernity is not a conversation taking place uh, in the scientific community. Uh, so before pursuing this question, I want us to think for a moment about one particular branch of science that's probably uh, most important to us, and that's medicine. Uh, and we have uh, medical experts in this room. Uh, every day, thoughtful, educated, highly skeptical people, even uh, postmodernists, uh, some of them trained in philosophy, place their lives on the altar of medical science. We invite our doctors to put us under, which makes us almost dead, cut us open, do stuff inside our bodies, and then bring us back. Uh, and in this practical way, we acknowledge the reliability of scientific claims. Uh, in less dramatic ways, our iPhones do the same thing. Every time you get a text on your iPhone, most of the laws of physics discovered in the last century are validated. <laughs> <laughs> the point I want to make here is that science has done an end run around philosophy. It has figured out how to acquire knowledge of the world without explaining how it has managed to accomplish this feat. So this leads to what I think needs to be the starting point for contemporary discussions of how we know anything. We start with the recognition that science has discovered true things about the world, and although we may not be able to justify those conclusions to the satisfaction of critics, we don't need to. The end results speak for themselves. To use a common metaphor, the proof of science is in the pudding. It matters mm -hmm. not that the greatest chefs cannot understand the recipe. The pudding is making its own argument. Uh, this then leads to the important insight that history and philosophy of science are appropriate vehicles for understanding the process of knowledge acquisition. Since we know that the uncertain historical scientific path has led to the certain scientific present, the detours and byways, assumptions and insights of that path are somehow validated. I'm convinced that this uh, insight, rarely made implicit, is why the history of science has become such a booming interdisciplinary field. A recent survey at Harvard University showed more students studying history of science than traditional uh, history. <coughs> so I make this point because I think the history of science provides insights into how knowledge acquisition works in general, even apart uh, from science. The most salient features of these insights are the following. Number one, science often moves rapidly forward with incomplete knowledge. When Newton, famous for discovering gravity, was asked what gravity was, he famously replied, hypotheses non bingo, I frame no hypotheses. The science of mechanics, both celestial and terrestrial, proceeded dramatically forward for centuries with no notion of the nature of its central feature, gravity. Quantum mechanics today is similarly puzzling. The quest for knowledge is thus compatible with the persistent existence of deep mystery. Number two, science regularly confronts anomalies. History is filled with countless observations that in principle refuted important scientific ideas. The orbits of both Mercury and Saturn refuted Newton's theory of gravity. They were profoundly inconsistent with Newton's equation for the force. But the overall success of Newton's theory convinced people to ignore the inconsistencies. The quest for knowledge is thus compatible with the existence of inconsistencies. Number three, a healthy scientific tradition embraces anomalies and uses them to move forward to find out new things. The odd behavior of Saturn was analyzed in terms of a possible undiscovered planet. Where would such a planet have to be to produce this anomaly? 
When Herschel pointed his telescope at the location where the new planet would need to be to explain Saturn, he found Uranus. The quest for knowledge should be associated with progress. Such progress is the mark of a healthy knowledge tradition. If investigation shows no progress, it should be abandoned. Fourth, science is communal. Scientific truths are not presented to the world at the conclusion of experiments and observations. Scientific truths are announced at the end of conversations. Observations do not interpret themselves, and virtually every scientific paper has a high-level conversation about its contents long before they are presented to the world in the form of a peer-reviewed article. The participants in such conversations often have very different types of expertise, all of which are needed to bring the truth most clearly into focus. Knowledge is thus best understood as residing in communities and not in individuals. There are many other things we can learn uh, from the history of science, but uh, I want to stop there. Uh, so uh, let me conclude uh, by noting that uh, the features of knowledge that I've listed here are broadly relevant, and in particular are relevant to religious truth. Mm -hmm. Against religious apologists, I want to push back and say that mystery is acceptable in the world. We should not require that our faith have a certain Euclidean type of axiomatic rigor. I want biblical fundamentalists, the problem of uh, the tradition of uh, Protestantism, uh, to let the Bible be riddled with inconsistencies, as we know that it is. I want to tell the creationist and the intelligent design folk that their projects are not leading to new knowledge and thus should be abandoned. And finally, I want the critics of science to know that a scientific consensus is not an indicator of groupthink, but rather a conclusion shared by experts who arrive at it along different paths. And likewise, I want religious lone rangers to pay more attention uh, to the collective wisdom of their traditions. Thank you.